Аркадий пришел совсем молодым человеком, и он пришел с войны. Он бывший солдат. И он был очень такой своеобразный человек. Это человек, не просто журналист, который писал о войне, а человек, который сам там был. И мне нравились его материалы тем, что он писал это ну, с точки зрения солдата, понимающего, что там происходит. Он был необычный журналист тогда, необычный. И поэтому, поэтому первые слова, которые я сказал его жене, когда я увидел ее этой ночью, я сказал, Оля, это я во всем виноват, это я уговорил его остаться здесь. И это был единственный момент, когда я, когда я рыдал просто. Обнимал ее, рыдал и стоял перед ней на коленях. The next day I was in a deep shock. Uh, I didn't know how to react. I started crying all of a sudden. I started calling all of his friends. We were. Я могу двумя словами сказать, что последствия этой реакции было, было то, что у меня появилось много седых волос и у меня очень сильно испортилось зрение. But Russia's most famous journalist was not actually dead. It was just one more twist in a life that first turned surreal when he joined the Russian army in 1995. It's not that I joined the army. I was just mailed the notice. We have conscription, so I had to serve. The 
The first Chechen war that I was involved in, there were no combats I was directly involved in. It was like this, you're 18, your major comes up to you and gives you a rifle, puts you on an armoured car and sends you to a place you've never heard of to defend your motherland. So I've been transported there, dug myself a ditch, sat there, someone was shooting at me, I was shooting somewhere in return. The first Chechen war was kind of a painless experience for me. And I can remember it more like a concentration camp than a war, because there was much bullying and very little food. So when I remember the first Chechen campaign, I recall beatings, the dead bodies, how we privates had to carry those bodies, how the bodies were stored on a runway, waiting for the next military plane to carry them home. I remember the things that had been done to people. I was lucky not to get caught in this grinding machine, and on 6th of August 1996, the day the Chechens won back Grozny, that was the day we had to be transported there. We've been lined up on a runway in a consolidated battalion. We've been literally scratched together from the arse of the regiment, radio operators, drivers, cooks. All those privates have been gathered into a battalion, lined up before the transport aircraft. And then there's a mailman running towards us with a message screaming, Babchenko, Babchenko, your father has died. So everyone went to Grozny and I went to Moscow. So I was sort of lucky during the first Chechen campaign. For the second Chechen war, I was a soldier again. I actually signed a contract. It was an irrational decision. I think it was clearly a post-traumatic stress disorder, a post-combat syndrome. I came back from the army in 1997, and it was a gangster period in Moscow. Together with wild capitalism, where everyone was running illegal businesses. And it was just a two-hour flight from the Chechen city of Mozdok to Moscow. So I was carried back to Moscow with a military aircraft, together with wounded soldiers and dead bodies. Imagine yourself two hours ago in a place where people kill each other, the place where children are being killed. And here you are on the Garden Ring Road in central Moscow. You're looking at all these Mercedes Benzes, casinos, all these bandits, and you don't understand what's happening. Are you people fucking nuts? There's a war going on by your side. How can you live like this? So I instantly hated Moscow's peaceful life. I just wanted to kill everyone in Moscow. So I went back into my institute, studied for two more years, got my diploma, and then the Second Chechen War started. It literally took me one second to decide to go to the recruitment office. My world was there, in the war zone. It was post-traumatic, clearly. My body came back from the war, but mentally I was still there. There's lots of movies about this, like Hurt Locker, for example, an excellent film that shows how it all works. The 1999 tower block bombings in Moscow killed over 290 people. These attacks were, according to the Russian government, committed by Chechens, a claim that led to the Second Chechen War and inspired a rush of volunteers, but not Babchenko. I didn't think like that. I didn't care. I didn't go to Chechenia. I just went to war. I didn't really care where it was happening. If it was happening in Chechenia, I would go to Chechenia. If it was happening in Krasnoyarsk, I would go there. If the war was in Moscow, I would be happy there. I did not have any kind of hatred for the Chechens or Chechenia itself, not ever. I understood really that they are protecting their homeland and we are the invaders, it's us who have come there with arms. I understood that this war was chauvinistic, it was an imperialistic invasion. But it was just war for me.
тогда, тогда Путина никакого не было. There was no Putin back then. He was just a project on that stage. He was just in the beginning of his promotion. He was head of the FSB, Russian state security, back then. Then he was prime minister, and then he became president when the war went full on. There is a theory that the Second Chechen War was a PR campaign to promote Putin to power, and it sounds quite reasonable. But back then, those tower block explosions were seen solely as Chechen terrorism. The first Chechen war was the one that Russia did not accept. During that campaign, Russian people said, what are you doing? Remove our soldiers from there. There is nothing for us there. During the second Chechen war, people in Russia were like, hey, hey, let's go kill those fucking Chechens. And it was clearly seen as a response to Chechen terrorism. The people were cheated by the government. I can remember the rhetoric change, because during Yeltsin's times, the rhetoric used to be for peace. Chechenia got its independence, so everything's all right. And then at some point, the rhetoric drastically changed. Russian propaganda began to say that Chechens are attacking Russians, that they kidnap people. And that was true. There have been hundreds of people kidnapped. And then stories about torture, explosions, then propaganda, propaganda. And at the beginning of the Second Chechen War, this propaganda did just what it was supposed to do. The same thing happened here with Donbass in Ukraine. And Russians fully supported the Second Chechen campaign. So this time the Russian army went for revenge. From the start, I did not accept Putin at all. It was trendy to say five years ago that we voted for Putin. We thought that after Yeltsin, the drunk, he will come and sort things out. But I did not accept him from the very start because I did not understand what the successor is. Yeltsin took his time to choose his successor, and in the end he chose Putin. I did not understand how it can be. Either you have democratic elections, or there's a czar that chooses a successor. So I considered him to be illegitimate from the very first day. He was not my president. But at the time, I was not interested in politics. I had things to do. I managed the veteran movement, doing things as a volunteer, buying crutches, wheelchairs, finding money for hospital treatment for ex-soldiers, things like hemodialysis, transplants, operations. This was the way I lived until 2008. It was not about being a patriot. I have never really been that much of a patriot. I was more on the side of the Russian army, the veterans. I was standing up for the army vets because how can you be like that? You've sent people to war, they've lost limbs, and the government just tosses them away. And we've been there together. So I was standing up for them. It was like that up until 2008, when the Russian aggression against Georgia started. When that happened, I started to actively think. I realized then that the aggression against Chechenia and Georgia was not an accident. It was the deliberate policy of the Russian government. In 2006, Babchenko published a much acclaimed book about his time in the Russian army, an institute he was highly critical of. It was not about the book that I published. I'd been working at Novoya Gazeta newspaper for several years. I have been working there since 2005, probably. I have been in opposition to this regime, so it went back several years. There was no specific point like, I wrote a book and became an oppositionist. I didn't even write a book, really. I just used to write prose, and it all got compiled into a book. I did not decide to leave Russia. It was not my decision to leave Russia but rather I was pushed out. I'd been told straight away by several sources, several times. At first, I was told there would be a major information attack against me, so I should brace myself. 
Это, в общем-то, было не мое решение. Нет, 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 нет. Мне было сказано прямым текстом, это было сказано из нескольких источников. Причем... Marina Yedenvich, everyone started to offend me in the media. The hunt was terrible, like one I've never known before in my life. It was not the first attack, but I never had it on such a scale. Then I got a signal that on February the 27th, my apartment would be searched. I was ready to leave already when the second signal came in. But then Vladimir Karamuza, a Russian opposition politician, was poisoned for the second time. He'd been poisoned before, but miraculously survived. I was ready to leave, but then Vladimir gets poisoned again, and I got this feeling inside me, this solidarity protest. Fuck no, I won't leave now. A day before or a day after, I would have possibly left. Poison me, kill me, jail me, I won't leave now. So, on February the 27th, as scheduled, five addresses were searched. People like Zoya Zvetova, a world-famous journalist and human rights activist, Mark Galpirin and others, had their places searched, were arrested. Galpirin jumped out of the window and tried to run from the FSB, but he was caught and dragged back to Lubyanka. But no one came for me. Someone crossed my name off the list. But the third time I was told, you're definitely going to jail. I didn't hesitate this time. I took my suitcases, grabbed a ticket and left. The Syrian plane crash was the starting point, yes. But it was not about pro-Russian journalists. It was about the Red Army Choir, Putin's confidants. It was a Russian military aircraft that flew to Syria and crashed. So I made a Facebook post about it, a rather neutral one, I thought, saying that I do not mourn, because in Russia there was much mourning, a feeling that, oh, our boys have died. And I said, who are you mourning for? These boys are people in the army uniforms of aggression. They were flying to another country that you are bombing now. They flew to Syria to support military pilots who are bombing peaceful neighborhoods. They did not deserve any mourning from my point of view. So this was a rather neutral Facebook post. But this was the beginning. A crazy pandemonium broke out. The country went mad. The same as I read in Remarque's book about Germany in the 1930s. I don't remember the exact book. It's either Three Comrades or the Black Obelisk. It begins with a crazy crowd killing a World War I veteran because he touched the national flag. It was that type of craze. I was later told that in this plane crash, some classified general died, and he was not named in public until now. And this general had a friend, an FSB general, who was in deep pain about this. So I became his personal enemy. So this was the beginning. I've been engaged in opposition activities in 2011, during the attempted Moscow revolution, during rallies against Putin. I started doing this very actively and have lived under serious pressure for five years. Two criminal cases have been started against me, followed by surveillance. Some people came to the place I lived. I think those guys just missed a chance because everything happened quickly. They were waiting for me near my front door. And I just went straight out and bumped into them, nose to nose. They were simply confused. I was constantly harassed in Russia, constantly. This last case was the cruelest one, but before that I was persecuted all the time. I've lived like this for five years in Moscow, tried not to go out of my apartment. The main problem is not that the FSB hunts you down. The main problem is that the country has gone mad. 
Under Russia's increasingly apocalyptic leadership, fascists, nationalists, and mercenaries have prospered as never before. Equally disturbing is the rise in both homophobic attacks and violent misogyny. In Britain, around 100 women a year are killed by domestic violence. In the Russian Federation, the figure is a staggering 14,000. You do not know when the next crazy patriot will come up with the idea of killing you. You don't know when some people in the street decide, look, there's that traitor, let's attack him, let's beat him. I generally live this way. At the Novoya Gazeta newspaper, seven of my colleagues have been killed. I buried my colleagues, I buried my friends. My friends have been put in jail. My friends were pushed out of the country. There were two attempts to poison Karla Mirza. Nemtsov was shot dead. Politkovskaya was shot dead. Estemirova has been shot. Gaskarova was put in jail. Chirikova fled the country. We constantly lived this way. When they came to me and said, well, my friend, you're next, it's your turn, then I had no questions, I understood, it was my time. It's the logic of the situation, just like that. After I left Russia, I was brought to Prague, to the Czech Republic. There is a special foundation there that helps journalists in trouble. Tried to get a visa to stay in the Czech Republic, but to get it I had to go back to Russia to submit documents. I told them, do you understand, I can't go back there, I just came here because I cannot stay there. Then the tourist visa ended, so I went to Israel and lived there for some time, a month or two. Then I came back to Kiev from Israel. I understood finally that my place is here. Since then I've stayed here. I do the same work here. I write articles. I work on the Crimean Tatar channel ATR, doing journalistic work. I started to relax. I didn't have this kind of feeling anymore. Although the hatred towards me continued on Russian TV and social networks, I had the feeling that I'm not going to get jailed, not going to get killed. I felt that they had put a neutralized tick against me, Russia's national traitor. Since I've been pushed out of the country, I'm surely out of their responsibility zone, and it really doesn't matter what happens next. So I thought I will live just like that. I would bring my family here, would live peacefully, naturalize, and continue a usual life. I have lived a year and a half here and there, in Prague, Tel Aviv and Kiev, but my family remained in Moscow because of the school, the apartment, etc. And their whole life was there. If you move everything, you have to break with everything. So they came on my daughter's holidays. When she had two weeks of holidays, they would come here. I got a call from work saying, could you come in an hour earlier before you go on air? I thought, sure, why not? I hoped they would be paying salaries or something. But when I came in, I saw a bunch of people and thought, this is not about salary. Then I was told, here are the people from the SBU, the Ukrainian Secret Service. They want to talk to you. So they showed me the papers, the assassination papers. They told me there's been an order for the wet work. They showed me the printouts, how the would-be killer talks to Herman, the organizer, how much it would cost to kill me, how and when it would happen. I've been told there's an order to kill me from Moscow, and they made me an offer to take part in a special operation. So I agreed at once. <laughs> The SBU told me about the operation a month after it began. The operation took two months in general. 
At first it was not clear whether these were just conversations or whether the assassination was serious. But when Herman gave Tissam Baliuk, the hitman, the money, it became clear that this was not just talk. I agreed to participate, and all this lasted another month. At first, the tactic was this. Continue living the life that you live. Don't frighten away the Russians. Let's conceal the fact the SBU is conducting its own operation. Then it became clear that this was too dangerous, because we did not know how many killers had been hired, whether there was one organizer or several. The SBU came up with the idea that I had twisted my leg. And so now I'm sitting at home and can't go outside. I wrote in Facebook that I'd twisted my leg on a morning run and that I'd been sitting at home with crutches for two weeks. But it was unclear if someone had been following me, if someone had been watching through the window or not. This, incidentally, came to be very useful, because in the printouts of the conversations, Moscow asked Herman, he goes for morning runs every day, why did you not kill him already? The thing itself had to happen on Friday. I went on air on ATR on Fridays. The legend was that I wouldn't come to the channel, they would start calling me, asking where I was. And someone from the TV channel would come to my apartment and find me dead. But that would not stick together since a lot of organizations would be involved. The police, the prosecutor's office, the court, and they could not legally integrate him. I had to come up with another story. I took my family to the summer house for a weekend that I would be absent from the city. I had to take my family away from Moscow because it was unclear how the FSB would behave when they found out. They could suddenly become furious, come to my apartment, toss in some drugs there to put my wife in jail. This is a common practice in Russia. The drugs could be thrown in in a second. Or they could start a case of pedophilia against the victim. So it was necessary to evacuate the family from there. So they took three suitcases that fitted in the trunk, took the car and came to us. At the end of it all, the final day had to be Tuesday, May the 29th. The day actually has to happen. We initially had been told that everything would happen on Monday or Tuesday. We woke up on Monday, but nothing happened. On Tuesday, May 29th, we waited till noon and thought that nothing would happen. I went on Facebook and wrote a post. But then they called us and said, today is the day. At six in the evening, an officer together with a makeup artist arrived to train us for about an hour. They told me how a killed person falls, how he coughs when his lungs are shot, how the blood flows, how to lie down, how the witness of the crime behaves all these nuances. During an hour of practice, I fell many times. My knees were bruised. So at 7 p.m. I had makeup, fell down, coughed the pig's blood out of my mouth. The makeup artist put a blood clot in my nose and said, I'm sorry, you'll have to suffer this. I said, that's okay, it's your job. My job is to lie still, so do what you have to. After the makeup, they smeared my t-shirt with blood, a shirt that had previously been taken to a shooting gallery and shot there with a gun. Everything had to look as real as possible. So when they left, there we were, me and my wife. My wife had to be in the bathroom. The story went like this. They left, we were two together. 
I had gone to the grocery store to buy some water. As soon as I came back and opened the door, the killer would shoot me in the back. I would fall, my wife would hear the noise, come out of the bathroom and find me. So she went to the bathroom, I laid down, and then the door opened. The killer came in and said, hello. I answered, hello to you as well. I then said, don't make me laugh, I can't do that. He stayed inside the apartment for another 10 seconds, closed the door and went. Then my wife called the police and the ambulance. The police arrived promptly, then special forces arrived. Then an ambulance came. I was brought downstairs, put into the ambulance, and they began to provide medical assistance, injected a dropper. It wasn't known if there was an observer, so they had to make it real. The ambulance drove off to the hospital, and halfway I began to die. So they started to do resuscitation. That lasted for half an hour and proved unsuuccessful. So I died. The doctor called the dispatcher, told him about my death. This was necessary in case the calls were monitored. We didn't know which phones could be tapped. It all had to be as natural as possible. Special forces surrounded the ambulance. The forensic expert arrived and began to describe what kind of clothes I had on, what kind of boots, what injuries I had. Then they brought me inside the morgue, and all this time I would act dead. This proved worthwhile since journalists arrived and confirmed that Babchenko's body had been brought to the morgue and that he is dead. They took me to the morgue and there I came to life. They took me to the orderly room, I took off my clothes, washed myself in the sink as best I could, washed off the blood, wrapped myself in a sheet that's used to wrap dead bodies in. I said, give me a pack of cigarettes and a cup of tea. This will be my payment. With a pack of cigarettes and a cup of tea, I turned on the television and sat there naked, wrapped in a sheet like Mahatma Gandhi, smoking and listening to the TV news talking about me. What a wonderful guy I was and how big a loss my death was. At the same time, the corpse man was soaring through threw some bones in a room nearby, and that was audible through the ventilation. It was an interesting experience. I stayed in the morgue till 2 a.m. Then I used the window to get into the backyard, got in a car, and they took me to a safe place, where I could finally wash myself properly. But I couldn't eat. It all began at 6 p.m., and ended at five in the morning. The reenactment lasted for 11 hours. In fact, everything went a little off plan since I was supposed to be dead for longer, three or four days, just to see how things would unfold, whose death would be ordered next, etc., in order to reveal the client to the maximum. But it just went a little off plan. Herman, the organizer, bought a ticket to Italy, so the SBU decided not to take any chances and they grabbed him the next day. I thought I would have a few more days rest, but they came to me the next day and said, that's all, there's a press conference today, go resurrect. So we went to the SBU HQ. I went there in the same stinking clothes. And then, well, I came back to life. You saw that already at the press conference. прокурор. И я понял, что, скорее всего, Аркадий жив, но все равно я до конца не был уверен, потому что мало ли что могло произойти. Прямым текстом мне никто не сказал, что он жив. 
И поэтому, когда э, я увидел его живым, только тогда я окончательно понял, что все нормально, и, и мне стало хорошо. I got a call from my friend, who is a friend of Mr. Babchenko as well. And he told me, you know what, he's alive. My reaction was like, stop bullshitting me. I couldn't believe it. And he was like, no, no, look in the internet. There's the SBU press conference live and he speaks as we talk. So I instantly fired up SBU Facebook and he was there and it was another shock, but a positive one. We, we just didn't know how to react again. So uh, Arkady is the guy who tends to surprise people. My first contact with friends did not happen soon. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere, literally, for a month or so. I can meet you because I understand the level of danger has been lowered from red to orange. Several months ago, they wouldn't let me meet anyone. The first three days we did not go anywhere at all. I did not want to eat or sleep and I did not want to live. It was so exhausting. It was such a strain that we were feeling empty. Later we were transferred to the bunker where we live now. And for a month I have been guarded like Barack Obama. Only later did it ease off a bit. I cannot meet friends, I cannot go to a cafe, I cannot go to a store, I cannot buy myself a pair of trainers. Therefore, there are still no meetings with friends as such. We only see each other for work. And then you've seen for yourself the security measures. Individual rooms, no one around, everything is like that. I often think of him, of Salman Rushdie now, because he lives about the same way I do, but for over 25 years already. I've been living like this for just three months, and that dude's been living like this for over 25 years, and I do not envy him at all. It's a very hard way to live like this, very hard. I would not say it is surreal for me. I've lived in a world where it's all reality. I have buried my friends. I perfectly understand. Therefore, for me, it is reality. Because it was not just about my life. Boris Herman, the organizer, was not charged with attempted murder of Arkady Babchenko, but rather with an attempted terrorist act by killing a public figure. That is, he did not really want to kill me. His job was to cause chaos in Ukraine prior to the elections for president, in order to shake the situation. In fact, the first target was Ida Muzdabeyev, deputy head of the Crimean Tatar ATR TV channel. But then they changed their plans. Но в газете, где мы работали, был убит первый журналист вообще в России. Это был Дмитрий Холодов, и это был военный корреспондент. Это был корреспондент того самого отдела, куда пришел работать Аркадий. Его убили по заказу министра обороны при Ельцине. Его убили за расследование коррупции в армии. Поэтому мы знали, что такое. Это взрыв произошел в редакции, его взорвали. Поэтому в той газете, где я работал, все понимали, что журналистика может быть смертельно опасной. 
I know exactly who and why is behind all this, but I cannot talk about it now. There was also a list of other people to be killed. At first there were two names, followed by 30 names, then 47 names. The second task was to prevent these murders. And here life changes dramatically. It simply changes completely. When someone says you broke the ethical principles of journalism because you worked with the secret service, well, okay, guys, no problem. God forbid that you should get into a situation like this. But when you get into a place where the SBU come to you and say that the Russian secret service want to kill you, well, would you climb on a stool like a Soviet pioneer school kid and say, no, I refuse to take part in this because journalists wouldn't understand it and my readers won't forgive me. This contradicts my ethical principles and norms. Well, then, go and die for the sake of your ethical standards. Are we forcing you to live? I think the scheme is broken now. There is a chain that goes from Moscow to Pinovanik that follows to Boris Herman, who is now in prison, to Simbaliuk, who had to be the killer. In order to try and kill me a second time, they need to build a new chain. Now there is some time before anything happens. There's been a big hype. Nothing needs to be done. But they still have their main task to destabilize Ukraine. In 2019, the elections for president will happen. Their most important task, perhaps, is to put their man at the top. Someone who would be more obedient. They will do everything for that, both terrorist and information attacks. They have bought a couple of TV channels already, and they will use them to brainwash people. There will be fake news, more aggression at the front lines in eastern Ukraine. There's money in Russia for this, a huge amount of money. There are many people in Ukraine who can be bought cheap by Moscow standards. The sum paid for my death was $40,000. That's pennies for Moscow. One can find hundreds of people willing to commit terrorist acts. Herman himself said that he is not the only person in Kiev for this. And I know for sure that in Kiev there is at least one more group, in fact several. Therefore, they will continue to use this tactic. Russia's interference in the elections for president in Ukraine have already started. Two TV channels have been bought by pro-Russian figures. This is a direct intervention. This is an information attack. Again, the bans on Facebook have now begun. Journalists and bloggers who are pro-Ukrainian have been banned. People with audiences of half a million. Not every media has such an audience. This attack has now begun. And this has not happened for several years. It's a powerful attack, and I feel it myself, because Facebook have banned me as well. Recently, I saw the Russian reaction to my death. Everything as expected. They are quite predictable. As soon as news about my death leaked out, the Russian media began to howl. Look at what's happening in Ukraine. Journalists are killed in Ukraine. That country is unsustainable. They can't control anything. Blah, blah, blah. Damn President Poroshenko. Damn the regime. Damn Junta. Then, when I came back to life, everything was also as expected. Tons of swill and yells. Fake news. Ukraine has misled the whole world. This was predictable, and you have to understand a simple thing. There is no mass media in Russia, except for a few names counted on the fingers of one hand. Novoya Gazeta, then possibly Echo of Moscow Radio, which is already half controlled by the Kremlin. 
then possibly Dots TV. All the rest is not mass media, it is mass propaganda. Same as in the Soviet Union. Even in the Soviet Union, it was not totally like that. The things happening to TV in Russia now are for the first time ever in the history of mankind, nowhere else to be found on Earth. I think Goebbels is now spinning in his grave, biting his elbows, because he did not have TV. He influenced through newspapers and radio. And in Russia, the zombie box is sending information directly to the cerebellum, bypassing the brain. I always say that the most important weapons of Russia are not submarines, nuclear missiles or tank divisions. The most important weapon of Russia is television, a zombie box. And it does the job perfectly. I saw the country go mad. In 2014, after the annexation of Crimea, I saw people in Moscow literally go crazy. Indeed, 86%, the number who vote for Putin, went insane. It was impossible to talk to them. They were in a state of altered consciousness, as if something had clicked inside them. All of a sudden, one couldn't talk to these people. One should consider this when asking what the mass media says in Russia. It says nothing because it does not exist. There is just mass propaganda. Young people use the internet, they are more free. But then again, look, everything has two sides. The first point, there is no critical mass for the situation to change. Young people go to the mass meetings of Navali in numbers of five to seven thousand. Then they are dispersed and that's all. People are not ready to go to the end. What happened here in Ukraine is impossible in Russia. Nobody will go to the barricades. In February 2014, three months of protest in the Ukrainian capital Kiev ended in a massacre and a revolution. In mid-February, Putin ally, President Yanukovych, ordered his brutal Berkut police to clear a Maidan square. In the square and the streets around it, over 120 demonstrators were shot dead. The outraged citizens of Kiev rose up en masse and forced the Berkut to retreat. Yanukovych fled to Russia, where he remains to this day. Putin, however, soon retaliated by sponsoring pro-Russian demonstrations in Crimea and by starting a separatist war in eastern Ukraine. My first impression about Maidan, and I was probably there for two months, my first and last impressions are the same. This is one of the best things that happened to me in my life. This is one of the most meaningful things in my life. It's about an uprising for freedom, for dignity. It was stunning. The unity a nation feels, the birth of a civic society, and its unification, when people were ready to walk towards bullets with just wooden shields, for freedom, for dignity, this can only provoke admiration. No other senses are possible. The situation in Russia is either not yet mature or is already over mature. I think it's over mature. These younger people grow up and just leave, leave or conform, and so a critical nucleus does not form. Things in Russia will continue about the same as now, a sluggish decay with small rallies. I can talk on this subject for weeks, so ask and I will answer. The most important thing to be said, of course, is that the world must understand who it is dealing with. The world must understand what Putin's Russia is now. The world must see that this is not some kind of democracy. What the world thinks now is that Russia is overall democratic, with a few rough spots. It's nothing like that. Russia is not a democratic country. Russia chose the path, the path to tyranny. Putin has undoubtedly become a dictator. Worst of all, he became a dictator with the backing of the majority. The majority of the population in Russia really support him, and the overwhelming majority of the population supports the annexation of Crimea. 
That's what I'm saying. It became impossible to talk to people. Now this hysteria, of course, has calmed down, but in 2014 it was terrible. People ceased to be people. Do you understand that? They lost the ability to think logically, and that includes progressive, democratic professors, academics, cultural figures. They had a curtain over their eyes and began to yell, we are the greatest, Crimea has returned to its native harbor. And when you asked them, what the hell do you want? Why do you need Crimea? What did you lack before? No, they would just say, we are the greatest, Crimea is ours. Тот канал, на котором я работаю, на котором работает Аркадий, это телеканал ATR, это крымско-татарский телеканал, канал лучший в Крыму, который показывал аннексию Крыма в прямом эфире. И кадры нашего канала брали CNN, Рейтер, там все агентства мировые. А потом, через год, оккупанты русские запретили этот канал, и канал был вынужден переехать в Киев. И они переехали из Крыма сюда, это мои друзья, а я переехал из Москвы сюда. А потом переехал Аркадий и тоже попал на наш канал. И наш канал, это канал крымско-татарского народа, это частный независимый канал, который всегда был частным и независимым от властей. И мы тут также работаем, и наша задача это информировать людей в Крыму о том, что происходит в Украине и мире, и информировать Украину и мир о том, что происходит в Крыму. Потому что большинство телеканалов не обращает на это внимание, а там происходят страшные вещи. In Crimea, southern Ukraine, the Tatar people remained loyal to Ukraine after the Maidan Revolution of Dignity. But pro-Russian agitation increased, and at the end of February 2014, Russian troops occupied Crimea. The Tatars, however, continue to proclaim their Ukrainian identity. They have paid a high price for their courage. The first victim was Rishada Mehta, a young father. His protest outside the Crimean parliament ended when he was seized by Russian soldiers and handed over to a pro-Moscow gang. He was bundled into a car and driven away. Two weeks later, he was found dead, his body bearing marks of multiple torture. Где бабашка? Даже не знаю, что им ответить. Дети, вот она дочка, вообще ночью не спит. Любимица его была. Sixty-eight children of Tatar activists have been effectively orphaned. Their parents detained. Their homes subject to constant raids. Even members of the Crimean Tatars World Congress have been seized. Erwin Ibrahimo was kidnapped in May 2016. He has not been seen since. Another 19 Crimean protesters were seized. Eight of them were later found dead. Despite these attacks, the Tatars have refused to recognize the gunpoint referendum that Russia used to justify their invasion. And Tatar leader Mustafa Zemilev refused to meet with Putin, giving instead a memorable response. But with Crimea in Russian hands, a media clampdown was soon underway. Pro-Ukrainian TV and radio channels were raided and closed. And the harassment of the Tata channel ATR soon turned violent. One year later, ATR's license was threatened. The 
the Tatars soon found themselves in a media ghetto. Their newspapers, magazines and websites blocked or closed down. Finally, ATR were unable to broadcast from Crimea. Tartar protests continue though, even though they are often met with threats and violence. Наша родина там, наши, наши, наши могилы наших предков там, ключ от Крыма у нас только. Мы те люди, которые могут отвечать за Крым, больше никто. И мы всех остальных украинцев призываем быть рядом с нами. Despite this brutality, there have been few stories in the Western media, and the EU continues to show little interest. И говорю о том, что Россия это очень опасно, и что с ней и к ней нельзя относиться мягко, потому что иначе это будет новый Гитлер, новая мировая война. Вот это то, чем я занимаюсь, я считаю, моя роль как журналиста говорить об этом везде, где только можно. Вот. Я говорю это западным политикам, дипломатам, говорю журналистам западным, что откройте глаза. Он придет в ваш дом тоже. Путин придет в ваш дом, и у вас, как у меня в Крыму, у крымских татар, он то же самое сделает с вами, если вы будете на него не реагировать и не пытаться с ним бороться. Но иде идеальный план у него это, конечно, развал Евросоюза. Тут вот недавно было интервью Макрона. Путин's dream plan is, of course, to collapse the EU. Just recently there was an interview with Macron, where he says that Putin aims to destroy the European Union. This is an absolute truth. This is his ideal plan. To destroy the EU. To revive the Soviet Union version 2 within the former Soviet borders. That's his ideal. I don't think these plans will come to life, although in terms of EU disintegration, he's turning out to be successful. Money defeats reason once again. I think that Russia's Nord Stream 2 gas link might make a breakthrough, finally. But compared to the East-West confrontation of the Soviet times, it's going to be nothing like that. Which, in my opinion, can be even worse, in fact, because Putin will then have very few tools to retain his power, and one of these tools, most likely, is a large war. What kind of a conspiracy can it be? Did someone go shopping and buy a secret poison developed by the KGB? Did someone poison a former KGB spy to frame Putin? And then poison an ex-KGB spy, Litnivenko, with polonium before that in London? And killed Politkovskaya before that? And before that, Yadaviev in Doha or Qatar. And before that, started a war in eastern Ukraine and Georgia. I'm sorry, but these idiot conspiracies are completely infantile. This is a regime that eliminates its enemies. Putin is an FSB guy. They cannot stand traitors especially those that carry important information. They just kill them all over the world. That's it. You'd be amazed how similar it is. The parallels are just unsurpassed. Russia is, from my point of view, acting as Nazi Germany did in the 1930s. If you look at the parallels, you'll be amazed how much alike they are. In Germany, a lost world war, total humiliation, help from the governments of the world. In Russia, a lost Cold War, total humiliation and help from the governments of the world. Then in Germany, there was a Renton mark and the economy starts to grow. In Russia, there is an oil-based ruble that helps the economy grow. 
After the growth in Germany, people started to go mad about their greatness, and there were demands for revenge. Same in Russia. People started to go mad about their greatness, and there were demands for revenge. Germany annexes the Sudetenland to protect the German-speaking people, and Anschluss Austria. And Russia annexes part of Georgia and later Ukraine to protect Russian-speaking people, and Anschluss Crimea. Germany sends their troops across the Mediterranean to wage a war in Africa. Russia does the same, almost in Africa. No big difference. Olympic Games here and there. Nation goes completely mad in both situations. In both situations, the civilized world first tried to keep the peace, then went for economic sanctions. The parallels are just unsurpassed. What was the end for Nazi Germany? We all know the answer to that. What happens this time? We will see. The current world order was established in 1945, and the main message was the sanctity of borders. Stop. We have killed 70 million people. This terrible war is over. Stop. Let everything be as it is now. Borders have been established. Everything will be like this from now on. This world order lasted for 70 to 75 years. This world order ended in 2014. Historically, the world order is not flexible. When a challenge arises, the world order either solves it or collapses. Therefore, Crimea, the return of Crimea, is the turning point today. Now, either the world will force Vladimir Putin to return Crimea to Ukraine, or the world order will collapse. No future predictions can easily be made. Putin is not alone. The world starts going mad. People with some kind of super idea in their heads begin to come to power all around the world. Namely Trump, who's come to power in America. Namely Erdogan in Turkey, the guy who's even more of a dictator than Putin. Or my favorite, Duterte in the Philippines who's killed thousands of drug addicts. In France, Le Pen has raised her ratings from 17% to 34% using Putin's money. I'm pretty sure about that. And when one has several regimes, all meeting at a single point, each one believing that it is the greatest, Check your combined display, too. Quick alert! Quick alert! Quick alert! CD. General, at this time, we have indications of a launch from the Soviet Union. The site report is valid. Signal right assessment is no. Copy the no. Check the ASCII printer. Copy no. CD release. I don't know how big the war could be. I don't really think he can start the Third World War, but he could still drink lots of blood. I don't know what his first target will be. What comes to mind is Donbass in Ukraine, obviously. He could try to capture Kharkiv or Odessa, some big cities. There's a possibility of that, a strong possibility. 
Something else quite possible is that he could try to unite Russia with Belarus, also very likely. Well, it's all the countries of the former Soviet Union, everything around the edge that suffers from Putin's influence. He does not regard former Soviet countries as being separate sovereign states. He thinks these countries are in the Russian sphere of influence. He uses them like sandbags to shield himself from the whole world. He lives in a world in which cursed Europe and the damned USA want to seize Russia, want to take possession of its oil. And he barricades himself from this aggression inside his head. He does this along the perimeter, Ukraine, Georgia, Belarus. All these former Soviet countries are the first ones to suffer, of course. I don't know how Arkady feels now. He, he won't speak about that too much. But of course, what he says is that he wants to provide the safe future for his family, his daughter, and lastly for himself. He is the guy that will always stand for freedom, even if he is in danger of being killed. He, he proved it many times already. You need to understand who you are dealing with and build your counter strategy based on that. Journalists around the world should investigate. And yes, they are probably in danger if they do, but if they don't, we are all in danger.